Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's Monday once again and that means it's time for your weekly wrap up and we've got a bunch of stuff to check out today including my new storefront and I'll explain why we had to change storefronts in a second. Uh, the Apple Store is beginning to remind me a lot of going to the Department of Motor Vehicles. I'll explain more in a, a little rant in a few minutes on that. I broke my iPhone X, which is why I had to go to the store in the first place. Uh, but I ended up using an iPhone 6S for a week, and I will tell you uh, how I feel it stacks up three years later to the new expensive iPhone X. Somebody was asking about 4K on this channel, and I'll explain why I'm not doing it just yet. I'm going to also talk about why I am posting more content in more places. That uh, might be some interesting stuff for all of you looking to become or if you are content creators yourselves. And we're also going to look at buying a name brand cheap PC versus a China bargain because in many ways buying that name brand can be like an insurance policy. Lots to talk about, so let's get to it. And I want to begin by thanking our newest member here on the channel, Aaron Lynch, who gave via my donor box page. I want to thank Aaron and everybody who's been contributing on an ongoing basis, along with everyone who watches on an ongoing basis, too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, we don't have an advertiser this week, but we do have a non-ad and affiliate link for Audible.com, which is one of my favorite services. I pay about 15 bucks a month for this and have been doing so for a number of years. And uh, with that membership fee, you get to download any book you want pretty much on the service. Most of them cost more than $15 on their own. So it's a good way to save some money on book consumption. And what I like to listen to are nonfiction books. So these three are in my queue at the moment. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a short book on astrophysics for people in a hurry. It's a really uh, quick read, but a good one. I'm going to start that one soon. I've been listening to Crushing It by Gary Vaynerchuk, who is uh, a independent content creator that built a pretty big social media business from what he learned producing content. And he's got some great advice for not only content creators, but small business owners as well. Good stuff if you are uh, looking to try to market yourself better. And I'm really looking forward to starting this book from Dan Abrams and his co-author David Fisher about Lincoln's Last Trial. Uh, Abe Lincoln was a lawyer before he became a president, and this book looks at, I think, his last case as a lawyer before he got elected. Uh, he was trying a murder case. I think he was representing the defendant in that case, too. So really interesting stuff here from uh, Dan Abrams, who, by the way, is the host of Live PD on A&E and a legal analyst for ABC. And one of the things that's nice about listening to nonfiction here is that I'm getting this stuff while I am alert, but doing other things that I have to do during the day. Uh, so it's really a great way to consume the, this kind of content. And if you are really looking for more interesting stuff to consume, there is tens of hours of it on Audible that you can consume every single month. So now let's take a look at the Week in Review. On the Extras channel, we unbox two low-cost Windows 10 PCs, the HP Stream 14 and the Acer Aspire 1 for 2018. I also unboxed a wireless microphone system from Samsung that I hope to get to a little later this week as well if you're looking for a uh, less expensive way to use wireless mics in your productions. Uh, on the main channel, we reviewed that HP stream. I also had an opportunity to do some uh, cheap uh, video editing on that laptop too, just to see how it handled that. That's going to be the video I point people to when they ask about video editing on these lower cost PCs. Uh, speaking of production, we also talked about Nutex NDI video protocol. Uh, really cool stuff that I'm using quite a bit here on the channel. Basically allows you to capture video over your network, so you don't have to run HDMI cables everywhere. Uh, you can see exactly how I'm using it in that video and let me know what you thought of it. And we also reviewed a new portable solid state disc from SanDisk, their Extreme Portable SSD. Nice little rugged solid state drive. As I mentioned in that review, we use a lot of those types of drives here on the channel just because we're always passing video uh, projects back and forth and they are great for that and super fast too. Check it all out in the master playlist down below in the video description. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind and this is week 79 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And in this segment, I like to talk about what I'm learning as a small business owner and a full-time content creator because every day, uh, is a learning experience, which is what I love about what I do. Now, normally I give you all the positive things that I'm experiencing out there doing this job because most of what I do is positive, but uh, this week I had two negative experiences with uh, two different companies that I depend on uh, to run this business. And we're going to start with my issues 
uh, related to my online store. And this started up a couple of months ago, but just the uh, lack of response from the company here made this really a problem that needed addressing this weekend. So as many of you know, I have an online store where I sell things that I previously reviewed here on the channel. Most of the time we're buying things and reviewing them and then putting them back in the box and selling them for a used price. And that works out great for viewers who are looking for a little bit of a better deal on something. And it works out great for me because I can sell something for just the credit card fees as opposed to having to go through eBay where we have to pay you know, 10% plus the credit card fees to get rid of some of the stuff we're trying to get rid of here. And as you know, uh, we need to be bringing money back in to recoup some of the overhead costs of buying this stuff. So uh, being able to find a way that we can retain more of that money is of course very valuable. And for a number of years, I've been using the Square online store now, Square is actually a pretty decent company most of the time, except on this particular feature. And I was under the impression that Square had very good fraud detection technologies on board so that when an order came through and it said, okay, this order is good to go, that they had at least done some due diligence on the card, making sure the addresses match up, making sure the phone number is correct. So I had no reason to believe that a transaction through the store validated by Square wasn't going to be safe. But apparently uh, the level of fraud detection they're doing on the store is not as good as they might be doing in other places. And a few months ago, I got an order for a laptop and a mini PC, about $350 or so, that turns out to be a fraudulent transaction. I got a charge back a couple of weeks after the stuff shipped out. Uh, the person said I never buy, bought this stuff. And when I went back to the order and looked at it again, I noticed it was going to a freight forwarder somewhere down south. And it also had a fake phone number on there. And Certainly I could have done more due diligence, but my understanding was Square was doing some of that due diligence themselves. And of course I've learned my lesson there. We now validate uh, some of these larger transactions. But what really got me were two things. One is that they have $200 in chargeback protection per month, but only uh, if the order is less than $200. So I thought maybe I would be only out $150 on this $350 order, but no, in fact, they went in and just took all my money out, or at least all the $350 out of my checking account, and there was nothing I could do. Uh, their customer service was terrible. All I got back to every response that I sent in was just canned BS. Uh, that was really just not a good uh, customer relationship here. So I really figured, you know, I got to start looking at some other stuff. So about two weeks ago, I got an order in for the Asus Nova Go laptop. And this time, of course, we went through our due diligence to start validating things. Turns out the phone number was disconnected. It was going to some random industrial park in California. And I said, nope, we're going to cancel that order. It doesn't look legit. I contacted Square again. I said, you got to give me more information to be able to make these determinations as to whether or not these transactions are good. Uh, so they send me back, of course, best practices for protecting yourself from fraud, a bunch of just canned language here once again. Uh, they also said, ship to the same zip code as the credit card's billing zip code. But unfortunately, Square doesn't provide the billing address to you, so you have no idea what it is. And I asked them to give, get me that. They can 100% see where I'm coming from, but unfortunately, you can't see the billing address on the online store. So that is the end of the story. So I said, you know what, I got to get off of this and start... Uh, something on my own. So this weekend I had some time and I spent most of Saturday kind of building my own store and I settled on WooCommerce, which is something that's part of WordPress. Uh, so I have WordPress running on my server. I put the WooCommerce thing on top of that. And what's nice about WooCommerce is that it costs the same as Square, which is nothing, at least for how I'm using it. It'll process PayPal, but it also uses Stripe as its backend credit card processor. And I have more faith in Stripe just because I think they do better fraud protection for online purchases. Square is really uh, building their business around in-person swipe transactions at a storefront. Uh, Stripe, of course, is a back-end API that's used by a lot of e-commerce providers, and I think they're putting more due diligence into validating these credit card transactions. And the Square online store is so bad that I'm going to not recommend people use it anymore. I think it's certainly easy to set up, it's easy to use, but there's just far too much risk involved, especially because they don't provide you the tools to validate some of these orders to make sure they're safe to send to somebody. And I just can't deal with that anymore. So the WooCommerce thing seems to be working just fine from a user perspective. It's the same address you've been going to, lon.tv slash store. It even looks kind of similar to how it looked before. 
uh, but you now have the choice between using PayPal or uh, a regular credit card transaction. And I have a little bit more peace of mind here that this is going to work properly. So that is the new store. Uh, pretty much the same stuff as the old one, but it did motivate me to put some more things up. I'm still struggling with a few things like shipment options and everything else. And that's really the pain here when you try to roll your own solution is that I spent most of Saturday working on this just to get myself to where uh, the Square store was with a single click or two. So that's my only gripe right now is I still have to tweak some of the shipping options and whatnot. But I think moving forward, this is going to be a lot safer for me and hopefully uh, safer for all of you as well. And now I want to talk about some issues I had with Apple this week and I should preface this by saying I'm actually pretty happy with my Apple products and generally uh, the support that I get from Apple on the phone but their store support has been horrible and it gets worse every time I experience it to the point where it's starting to feel like going to the Department of Motor Vehicles they have way too many people to service they can't service anyone effectively and there's no flexibility for trying to help customers out when a specific non you know formulaic issue pops up and uh, they really don't have respect for people's time so this is what happened to me this week i dropped my phone which is my fault of course broke the back screen there and also broke the front of the screen here as you can see and it's kind of a neat thing when an oled uh, panel breaks like this you get some cool effects like you see there it just had this big bright white band uh, on the bottom of the phone that was really quite blinding on there. Um, so I had to go get my phone repaired. So I looked at what the options were. Now I did have um, Apple Care that I bought when I got the phone because as expensive as it was, I figured this might happen and I need to have some means of uh, getting the phone repaired without having to replace it for full replacement costs. So I went with the Apple Care. And then when you go onto the Apple support site, they really, really push you to bring the phone in for repair versus sending it in for repair. So when you see your options here, you know, if you depend on your phone like I do, you want the most immediate response. So obviously here sending in for repair, they say may take up to five business days, but I figured, hey, you know what? If I can bring it in for repair, uh, let's get this done and, and over with and we'll move on from there. So you click on bring in for repair and what Apple does now is they give you some options because they have approved places that are not Apple stores to repair phones. And what it, as it turns out, there were some Best Buys that were closer to me than my Apple store that could help me, but they give you the warning that it might take five to seven days, which is just as bad as shipping the phone into Apple, at least from their uh, main screen there. So I opted to go uh, to my closest Apple store, which is in New Haven. Now this store, even though it's 25 miles away as the bird flies, uh, it takes me about 38 minutes one way to get there. So if you think about the time commitment here, we're looking at about uh, three hours to get this transaction completed. And uh, for those of you, you know, who are running your own business, as you know, when you leave the office, there is nobody to do your work. And that means you really have to make a conscious decision to uh, work harder later in the day or do something else to get the amount of work you need uh, done in that day when you take three hours midday to deal with it. And I can't do stuff at night because I got the kids and everything else. So I said, all right, I'm going to buckle down and make an appointment. So I made an appointment for uh, 1130. And I drove out there and at 11.25, I arrived at the store. I checked in with the concierge there and they had, they had me sit down at the table and I'm thinking, okay, so 11.25 and then 11.30 rolls by. Here's my appointment time. Nobody shows up. 11.35, 11.40. Finally, at 11.45, 15 minutes after the appointment is supposed to start, uh, somebody starts casually strolling in my direction, talking to some of his coworkers, just kind of looking around. And then he says, oh, are you, uh, are you Lon? I'm like, yes, I'm Lon. I was here for the 1130 appointment. It's now 1145. Uh, and then begins the negotiation on the phone. Because part of what I wanted to discuss with this guy is that I actually had some warranty issues that were uh, a problem, but not enough for me to bring it in. Namely, the, uh, the wireless charging feature stopped working on my phone and my camera stabilizer was out of whack on the back of the phone. And what happens with Apple is the second you have any physical damage, any at all, uh, the warranty repairs that might be legitimate are suddenly mood issues and they won't even talk to you about it. So I was not able to uh, even discuss the fact that there were problems with the phone irrespective of the fact that it had a broken screen. He said, well, no, your only option is to uh, get the phone completely replaced because the back is damaged. So if the back of the phone is damaged, the entire phone is replaced, has to be replaced, which is really bad if you don't have Apple Care, uh, because I think the non-warranty replacement cost, if you're not an Apple Care uh, subscriber, is over $500 on the iPhone 10. So it's crazy expensive. So they 
said, all right, you know, we got to do the replacement here. Now, I assume that this being the official Apple store, they had one sitting in the back there to replace my phone with because if somebody strolls in to buy an iPhone 10, they usually have them now uh, in stock. And he starts doing all his diagnostics and he's doing all this other stuff. And after, you know, 20, 30 minutes of having this back and forth with the guys, oh, well, we don't have any here. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, you'd had me here for 30 to 45 minutes. You didn't have stock. You knew what kind of phone I was bringing in. You couldn't call me first or tell me you didn't have a replacement. Well, nobody can see into our inventory. I said, well, well you can. Uh, and that was the thing they kept saying to me is that nobody can see into our inventory, including Apple corporate with $100 billion in the bank. Walmart sees into every store's inventory every day. I don't buy it. Nonetheless, I had to basically walk out the store with nothing because they didn't have a phone to replace mine with. Um, I wasted now three hours, essentially, traveling to the store and back. Uh, insult to injury, I still had to pay parking on my way out, which was even crazier, and I ended up with nothing there. And uh, what I ended up learning from my experience here at the Apple store, uh, oh, the other thing they wanted to do, they wanted me to drive around to some other stores to see if maybe they had one too, like I've got time for that. So it was just insulting that there's just no respect for my time, and the assumption is that everybody just happens to live within a block of their Apple store, so it's no big deal to come back uh, to the store later. Um, so my lesson here was to skip the store and actually do that mail-in service because what happens is when you click on the mail-in option, uh, they call you. And when they called me back because I have Apple Care, they said, oh, if you're an Apple Care subscriber, we'll do the advanced replacement. So they actually send out a new phone, this one, I got this over the weekend. Uh, they send it out to you like FedEx overnight, and then you take your old phone, put it back in the box, and ship it right back to them. That was not an option available to me when I first went through that online process. My assumption was the store was the only option to get an immediate fix, but they were able to do it through the mail. And every phone experience I've had with Apple on support issues has always been top notch. They deal with the problem. They're able to be flexible about the problem. We had the issue with my uh, MacBook speakers blowing out. They treated that a very, uh, very serious issue and they very quickly responded and got me going again. Uh, so the phone response has always been really good, but the stores really stink. They don't respect your time. They don't meet you at your appointment, at your appointed hour or your appointed minute. You make, they make you sit there and wait uh, 15, 20 minutes after your appointment time at, at a minimum. Uh, and then you get this, this attitude there that they can't do anything for you. The funny thing was they called me on yesterday to tell me my replacement phone came into the store. I said, I never asked for that. Um, and I said, I ended up going through the mail-in thing. And they actually hung up on me when I was complaining about my experience at the store. So there's clearly no interest in actually serving the customer at these stores. Even worse, when I had the manager come over, he just repeated everything the other guy said to me. And I said, look, you know, you got to do better here for your customers. You got to do something for me. Why don't you find a solution here that can at least uh, kind of bridge me over until this phone comes in? No interest in helping me whatsoever. And I said, well, I want to register this complaint somewhere. He goes, oh, you'll get a survey in your email. You can respond to that. That's it. So the stores stink. Um, avoid them. Uh, go through the uh, phone number and you'll have much better luck with Apple. So thank you everyone for hearing me out as I vented here with my uh, Apple repair experience. Hopefully you've learned from my loss of time here that the best way to get your phone repaired or any kind of Apple service is to call them on the phone. They are so much better on the phone than they are at the stores. And really the store is be has become, to me at least, the digital equivalent of the DMV. They waste your time just the same. Now what I did though while my phone was out of commission is I switched back to an iPhone 6S uh, that I bought three or four years ago now because uh, this is the spare phone we have in the house. So my phone strategy here is that I get the new phone, uh, my wife gets my old phone, and then the phone she's using becomes the spare. So this iPhone 6S has been around the block and back again, and it's been sitting in a drawer basically. And part of my reason for getting the iPhone 10 fixed so quickly was that I felt like this would not work as well for me, uh, given that it is a phone now two generations behind or whatever. And to be honest with you, uh, there was not much of a usability difference between my 6S and my 10. In fact, there were some things that I preferred going back to uh, the old phone. One, namely, is uh, the fingerprint sensor versus face ID. And there's a couple of areas where having to put the phone up to your face is very inconvenient, uh, especially when I want to listen to Audible. Uh, usually what I do with my phone is I you know, summon the, uh, the, the person inside the phone, say, hey, you know what? Uh, launch Audible. And on the iPhone 6S, I can just put my finger on the phone while I'm driving and I have to look down at it and it unlocks the phone and switches to the app. iPhone 10, not the same thing. You can't really do that because you have to hold the phone up to your face even to launch an app while the phone is locked. And uh, that was one thing that really was bugging me with the 10. And I kind of liked not having to deal with that when I was using the 6S. 
The other thing though, just from a standard functionality standpoint, the 6S felt fine. It wasn't too slow. It was loading up all the apps that I used throughout the day. The only big difference was the camera. The camera, of course, is much better on the 10, but in good light, the 6S camera is just fine. It even shoots 4K at 30 frames per second, and it's a darn good phone. It was a good phone when it came out, and it's a, still a good phone now. Apple still actually sells this phone, and I think if you've been thinking about upgrading, is it really a big jump going from a 6S to an 8 or a 10? You know, it really isn't from a standard usability standpoint. I would recommend maybe if you've had that 6S for a couple of years to get the battery replacement service before that expires. It's $29 to get the battery replaced um, because this 6S, because it had sat in a drawer for a while uh, and completely discharged, I got uh, this warning up when my battery ran low. Remember how Apple was under siege because their phones were slowing down the older they got? Well, this phone is dealing with that issue. So what happened is, is that the, the battery was draining very quickly. Uh, and then when it got down to like 20%, it just shut off because it was not able to provide enough power for whatever the phone was doing. So it put itself into this uh, low powered mode. Now you can turn this off now if you want, but again, when you get down to 20%, the phone will shut down again. But even in that low powered mode, it didn't feel all that bad. So I'm gonna go get that battery repaired because it's only 30 bucks and I'll probably uh, just keep hanging on to that phone until maybe the next round of phones comes out. But it's funny, back you know, a couple of years ago, it was a big jump going from a 4 to a 6 or a 6S, but the jump from the 6S now three generations up isn't that much of a jump. And I'm uh, going to guess that the next round of iPhones will only be very incremental as well. I think we've kind of hit uh, kind of the, the potential of the current uh, batch of technology here. And I think there's going to be some time before we see a huge jump in performance that makes a 6S obsolete after three years because this phone clearly uh, is still very, very capable. And it was a pleasure to use it, even though it wasn't as flashy as my flagship iPhone 10. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And we got this question in from Robbie Gaming HQ, uh, who noted in my hard drive review that I had some video recorded at 4K but why am I only outputting at 1080p? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that Comcast has some really slow upstream speeds where I live, so it takes forever to upload a 1080p video, let alone a 4K video. Uh, so I was doing some 4K 60 stuff shot with my iPhone uh, on the Extras channel, but I felt it was overkill <laughs> given uh, what I was doing in those videos and the amount of time it was taking to get those videos uploaded. Even like a three minute video was two or three gigabytes. And uh, one of the reasons why I do shoot 4K on the Extras channel and sometimes for things that I'm doing on this channel is that when you edit 4K at 1080p, you can essentially zoom in like 200% on a video without losing any quality uh, because 1080p is that much lower in resolution than 4K. So you can almost cheat and get uh, two different camera angles, essentially, out of a single shot. That's how the Mevo works. It shoots at a higher resolution and does these digital zooms uh, that don't look that bad because it is shooting at 4K natively and outputting uh, at 1080p. Uh, at some point, I will make the switch, but the reason why we shoot 1080p on this channel is that I use a TriCaster to record everything that I do in real time. So what you see on screen right here is not edited. Uh, I'm able to switch cameras live here like you see and get pretty much a very quick and easy edit done when I'm done because most of the editing I did was done while I shot the video and that really makes life a lot quicker here on the channel for production. Uh, you can see a live stream that I did about two weeks ago if you want to get a sense as to my whole workflow. We actually took a, a video from start to finish on that stream. It was kind of fun so you can get, get a sense as to how it all works. Uh, they do have a TriCaster now that can do 4K. Um, but to get there, it's like about 20 grand at least just for the hardware, uh, let alone what I'd have to get for cameras and everything else. So at some point, they'll probably have a more affordable option for me to do 4K, but for now, I think 1080p 30 is going to be just fine. And this next question came in from Teddy about my frequent Facebook uploads lately and whether or not they're actually monetizing anything now. Uh, and the answer is no to that question. Let me show you this video clip here. This is very typical Facebook. So here I am filling out their creator form. You can sign up to become an official creator on their platform. And I'm clicking the mouse here. Look what I'm trying to click on the form. I'm interested in earning money with ads, but they put the option there, but don't make it clickable. This is such typical Facebook nonsense that uh, they continue to basically get a lot of free content from all of us, uh, yet share revenue with nobody. 
Um, maybe they do for some people they hand pick, but for the most part, every uh, thing you see on Facebook from me and many other independent creators uh, is not monetized at all, and I think it's not nice to do that. Uh, YouTube, of course, uh, does provide a very nice means of monetizing your content in many different ways. Twitch is doing a nice job with that. Amazon is doing a nice job with that now too, but uh, here on Facebook, nope, the answer is no soup for you. Uh, but what I have been doing uh, is posting stuff there anyhow because uh, this video that you watched takes a lot of time to do every week and its value in the ecosystem usually lasts about two or three days as a 30 something minute broadcast. And after that, nobody's watching it because it's mostly going to subscribers. Uh, there's not a lot of search value to a 30 minute video like this. So generally after a day or two, uh, the monetization pretty much drops through the basement as do the views. And I figured, you know, I need to try to get some more value out of the wrap up. So that's why uh, we've been doing more on Facebook, on LinkedIn, taking clips of this, putting it in different places. We've got the snippets channel also that I'll show you in a second. Uh, but these things are generating nice discussion. And I think in some cases people may have missed the original video or maybe they didn't want to watch 30 minutes, but they can watch this clip, quick, quick clip on a topic. And this particular one did really well. It reached 955 people, had a bunch of comments and it's not huge. You know, it's only about 290 views of any uh, length, but it's better than nothing. And I think it keeps my brand out there. Uh, that was one thing I gleaned from Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, book was that you really should just put your stuff out there just to keep the brand uh, fresh and in people's minds. And I wasn't doing all that much with the Facebook page. So I figured this is a good way to do that. So uh, we're doing that on Facebook and LinkedIn. And we also started doing more on the Snippets channel where we got much more um, you know, religious about putting these clips in the, the Snippets channel. And the Snippets channel is starting to get some traction, which is good. Uh, we're almost to 1,000 subscribers. Uh, we still are about halfway there on watch time to get that channel monetized, but we are getting there. Uh, and we're going to keep just putting stuff up there. It's starting to get some search traffic and whatnot as well. And some of these clips actually do have value beyond just this show and uh, can last a good long time. So we're going to be doing a little bit more with this stuff over time and feel free to interact with me anywhere. And remember, we also put this show up in audio form as a podcast too, so you can listen to it uh, if it's more convenient to consume it that way. And this next question was a very good way to describe the difference between buying a cheap PC from a name brand uh, versus buying one from some unknown brand that has no real customer service attached to it. Uh, so Vin Vega here says, buying an HP is kind of like buying an insurance premium. Sure, it does seem like you get more hardware bang for the buck on those direct China machines, but if they ever break, you're kind of on your own. And I uh, went out to GearBest just to see what uh, has similar specs for uh, similar price points here, and they have this Chewy Laptop, Lapbook SE. I don't think we've reviewed this one yet. I'll try to get it in. Uh, $269 right now on sale, $300 normally, so just a little bit more than the HP, uh, but it has a lot more inside of it. So if we compare one to one, uh, the Chewy has a quad-core processor versus a dual-core on the HP. Uh, the Chewy's got 1080p versus 720p on the uh, HP. Backlit keyboard on the Chewy, which you don't have on the HP. Metal case versus plastic. And it's also got upgradable storage on, on the Chewy, which you don't have on the HP. So it seems like, wow, that's just so much more for the money. And it is, but if it ever breaks, you're out the money. I've heard from a lot of folks who've never really had much support from Chewy when things went wrong. And uh, in many cases, if they are able to help you, you've got to ship it all the way back to China versus uh, some repair center somewhere in the country in which you live. So uh, again, this is kind of the differences here between getting something really cheap versus getting something that has a little more support behind it. Uh, the other neat thing with the HP Stream and the Acer we're looking at this week is they also give you a year of Office 365 in the mix too. So there's some added value in addition to the customer support advantages as well. And now it's time for a Q&A for you. And I'm thinking a lot about customer support this week, as you can see. Uh, and I'm curious as to what some of your good customer support experiences have been. We always hear about the bad ones, but let's hear some good ones. I talked about a great one I had with Audible a few weeks ago here on the wrap up. 
I'd like to hear some positive things that you've experienced dealing with companies, whatever the company is, local or Amazon or whatever, let me know down in the comments below. That might be a fun way to look at this issue. Our channel of the week this week is Retro Man Cave. This is another emerging channel that's been doing some great work on uh, retro hardware, including some stuff that may not be as well known to everybody. So they just did a big thing on the Sharp X68000 Pro. They did a really in-depth look at the hardware, and then they did a three and a half hour live stream playing a bunch of games on it. This is a really cool looking machine that I really didn't know about uh, back when it was available because it was primarily in Japan. And it's just so fun to watch these channels because they get things that I always wanted as a kid and they really put them through their paces and you can get a feel for uh, what that hardware was like and they do a great job. So check out Retro Man Cave at the link you see there. So this week on the channel, I've got a couple of things planned. I do hope to get this Acer laptop reviewed for all of you and compare it to the stream. Uh, it's got a 1080p display versus the 720p on the stream and costs the same. Uh, we did unbox it on the extras channel. It's not upgradable, unfortunately, but we'll see how this one stacks up. Uh, it is <laughs> sitting dormant over there. We got most of the review stuff started, but we can't take it out of S mode for some reason. I think Microsoft server is down this morning, so we've been uh, just stuck in S mode. So hopefully when we get S mode off of it, uh, we'll get the rest of the stuff uh, ready to go on that machine and hopefully have a review up for you in the next day or two. And I'm finally ready to do my review of this PTZ optics camera. Uh, one of the things that is challenging for me on the channel is when I have something new to review, things that I don't typically look at, which is what this camera is. I really like to spend a lot of time learning about the product, all its features, how it's advertised, and I'm finally, I think, at a point now where I can effectively uh, communicate my thoughts on this device. Now, this is a camera that kind of looks like a security camera, but it's used in video production, and it's something that you can control remotely, and it also supports that new tech NDI standard we covered last week, and it's also supporting power over Ethernet, so you can basically plug in a single Ethernet cable into this camera and then get everything up and running without having to have any electrical brought over, and you can control it from anywhere on your network also. Uh, so I know these cameras really are pretty popular with houses of worship and schools, places where it's not practical to have a camera person. You can just mount these things and uh, get all these crazy camera views going uh, from a remote production location. Good stuff, and we'll be taking a closer look at it later this week. And I got some other stuff, too, that came in. I'm going to start playing with it, and as we uh, get those things ready for review, we'll have a few other things up this week, too. It'll be a surprise, probably a surprise to me, too, uh, but we've got to get ourselves a little organized here this week, so uh, stay tuned. More to come. Now, if you want to help support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or one-time contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required, we get a little commission for that. We also have a Plex Pass option, so you can get their premium services uh, through the link you see there. We'll get a larger commission for that. And you can also gift Plex Pass to somebody you know or love or hate. Uh, you can do that at Plex Gift there, and we'll get a commission for that too. We have other channels, the Extras channel, which I've talked about a bit on the uh, show this week. We have our podcast feed that you can see up there, our Snippets channel, which I talked about as well, and my live stream archive is at lon.tv slash live streams. We're doing more of those. I'm having fun with those. I hope to do more uh, in the near future. I do suggest you click on the bell to get notified every time we do something new on this channel. So anytime something happens, you'll get notified of that. And we have ways to engage with me and the channel. Uh, our email list is at lon.tv slash email. The Facebook page is at lon.tv slash Facebook. We also have a Facebook group that has over 400 people in it. It's been great, a lot of great discussion. What's nice about it is that it allows viewers of the channel to talk to each other. And there's been some great discussions in there, a great community. And if you haven't checked it out, sign up and I will let you in. And then, of course, we've got the brand new store at lon.tv slash store. And you can sign up to get free store alerts, free of charge, to have you buy stuff uh, every time I add something to the store as well. And uh, one of the neat things now about hosting this myself is that I could probably have this be an automated procedure now, too. That is next on the project list after I get some of the shipping options worked on. So uh, stay tuned for that. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. Thank you all for letting me vent a little bit about some of the frustrations of 
uh, dealing with some of these companies, but I think it's important for people to know uh, what some of the pitfalls are sometimes out there and where the better solutions might be. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. Keep those questions, comments, and suggestions coming. We'd love to get some review ideas from all of you too, so let me know down in the comments section there, and we'll see you very soon. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast. Tom Albrecht. Bill Reiner. And Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.